evening. I'm going to call this uh, this meeting to order tonight um, at 5 p.m. Um, this is the meeting of the uh, Surplus Property 711 Committee for the Azusa Unified School District. Um, moving on to item 2.0, the roll call. Um, for, for most meetings, we'll probably do a standard roll call. For this first meeting, I wanted to kind of go in a circle and have everyone introduce themselves um, just because this is an introductory meeting for the committee to get to know each other. Um, we'll start here on my left. Yes, just your name, please. Um, and a little bit about you, maybe why you were, why you applied to be on the committee would be great, but very brief. It does have to be pretty close to you uh, to speak into it. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Hector Miranda. I am a teacher here in Azusa Unified. I'm also a parent. And I have been in Azusa all my life, and I would just like to know what's going to happen with the properties. Hello, uh, my name is Johnny Liu. I'm a small business owner here in Azusa, and very excited to be a part of this committee. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Stephen Castro, who's the Chamber of Commerce. It's a very I'm Ed Halava, 30 year resident, former teacher, 40. Hi, my name is Vanessa Jones. I'm a parent, uh, two students here in the Azusa district i have two of the properties come near me my residence so i uh, want to get involved in seeing what those are going to look in the future i'm sam perdomo i'm the principal at gladstone high school and i thought it i wanted to be part of this committee to hopefully have a voice in what we're going to do next with the properties Good evening, everyone. I'm Terry Monharaz, and I'm the resource teacher at Ellington School, and one of the properties that's closing that's near and dear to my heart. I'm also here representing our teachers union, Azusa Educators Association. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Lori Ray, and I'm a uh, classified employee here. I'm the textbook warehouse keeper for the district. I'm also the chapter president for the uh, classified union with the CSEA. And I'm also a, a resident of uh, the city for 40 years. So I'm very interested in seeing that the, the land is um, used, you know, that the best use of it can, you know, happen. Hi, I'm Latasha Jamal, Assistant Superintendent of Business Services for Azusa Unified School District. Good evening, everyone. I'm Arturo Ortega, Superintendent of Azusa Unified School District. And I'm very uh, thankful and grateful that you are all here today. Uh, and joining us on this journey, uh, as some of you have stated, for a very important uh, decision for our district. So thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Polito. I am one of the attorneys that assists the district. I've been focusing on this, uh, this journey with the surplus properties over the past couple months. Um, so I'm really here to help facilitate the committee um, here today to kind of, you know, provide some introductory information about the way the the committee works, um, some of the requirements within the education code, and then kind of help facilitate as we move forward. I look forward to working with you all. Um, I'll pass it over uh, to Mr. Brown, who joined us just a minute ago. We were just doing a, um, a brief introduction, um, so feel free to give us your name and just a little bit about um, why you uh, uh, wanted to be part of the committee. Sorry about that. I'm a habitat for humanity person and uh, building houses and and repairing homes. I was the executive director of uh, the Santa Maria affiliate about an hour north of uh, Santa Park. 
Episcopal Baptist for 17 years. All right, we're moving to public comment. I apologize. Um, um, so I'm gonna ask now whether there were any any comments received either in blue cards or by Zoom. All right, I see one um, for Mr. Mr. Jack Hall. Please feel free to um, walk up to the podium and your three minutes start. Okay. Hi, my name is Jack Hall. This is my son, Jack Hall. We own and operate a day program for developmentally disabled in Glendora. We are currently at Whitcomb High School. We have leased classroom space there about 7,000 square feet for the last 36 years. Uh, we have a great relationship with the school district. They recently, three weeks ago, gave us 90 day notice. We have 120 clients enrolled in our program, plus 35 employees that are all local residents. Uh, the issue at hand is we need to find another location. Um, we have been over to Brendel School and Power School uh, with Brian Allen and looked at the facilities. We've been talking with Melissa Vera uh, in the, their office. and. Uh, Bottom line is, either one would be appropriate space for us. Even if we could get a, what I'll call a short-term lease of a couple of years, that would give us time to find a more permanent location and not cause interruption in the program for the time. Um, we'd be interested in a longer-term lease. We've spoken with some of the people at the ROP program at Drendel School. Uh, I know that has no bearing, but it looks like it would be a good fit. We look at the uh, manufactured classroom that are on the north side of the school. We could utilize that entire section there and possibly some of our clients could transition to the ROP program. You know, the need is growing all the time. We currently are sitting on over 20 place packets, place clients in our program. We are funded and supervised by the San Gabriel Valley Pomona Regional Center. Uh, again, I've been in this business since the Lanterman Act, 1976. Uh, we're good tenants. We take care of things, maintain the property, uh, we've done the paving, painting of the building, everything at our expense, make sure we have a nice place for the plant to go. So our problem is time. Okay, thank you very much. All right, have we received any other comments or anyone from Zoom that, that would like to make a public comment online? We currently have no hands raised on Zoom. All right, so then we'll move on to um, item 4.1 on the agenda, um, which is the introduction and presentation of district uh, of district data. Um, this will be done um, by Ms. Jamal. Thank you. And we'll wait so we can get the presentation up. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. We apologize. We'll get the presentation up in a second.
that's fine. We can just scroll through, through, um, through that, through that piece. So, uh, thank you so much. Um, we wanted to uh, begin our uh, committee uh, by talking a little bit about our past, our present, uh, and our future. And so, uh, to ground us all on um, what we do and what we're about in our district. Um, this is our vision, uh, mission, and core values uh, that we currently have right now. Hope, can you press the plus sign at the top there? One more time. Awesome, thank you. Uh, can someone please uh, turn on their microphone and read the vision for us? Each student will be a problem solver, critical thinker, an effective communicator, and a positive contributor to the community. That's our vision in Azusa when we think about all the students that attend uh, our schools. Uh, can someone please unmute their mic and read the mission? The Azusa Unified School District equips every student with the knowledge and skills for college and career readiness to fulfill their purpose and positively impact society. That's the vision. That's how we go about our business. Uh, and then the following core values is what we um, strive to demonstrate in the classroom, in the office, in the kitchen, in the district office, uh, in classrooms. These are the, the values that we try to uh, do when, when, whenever we're, we're, we're going about our, our work and um, our day to day. So can somebody read the core values for us? Collaboration, honesty, integrity, being student-centered, accountability, equity, and excellence, and transparency. And so as we think about ourselves as a surplus uh, property committee, uh, we are hoping that we too can embody um, these values as we work together um, and keep that vision and mission in the back of our minds as we are uh, moving forward with uh, the work that lies ahead of us. Uh, these are we're not gonna we're we're not gonna read through these, but what I do want to point point out is that these are our uh, five strategic goals. And when we think about the work again that that lies ahead of us, of course, the the one that sticks out the most is that last one in terms of uh, facilities. Uh, but it's also about community engagement, having these meetings open and public, uh, having a a group of stakeholders that represent uh, the community. Of course, the fiscal responsibility, um, and so these these goals fit perfectly into what we are about to embark on. So, with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Latasha Jamal, who can give us a little bit about the history uh, of Azusa in terms of our students. Good evening, and I would share that um, this presentation is in your binder, so you can follow along. Um, so we're going to start with our historical enrollment. So, as we could see, back um, in two thousand two to two thousand three school year. We had over 12,000 students enrolled in Azusa Unified School District. Fast forward now to our current um, school year, 22-23, we're sitting at exactly 6,600 and 900 students. So you'll see we, um, this is, I also want to state that the decline, this is across the state of California, it's not unique to Azusa, but this is just to give us a historical trend to show where we were and where we are today. Now we're going to talk about enrollment by schools. So we're going to start with our um, elementary schools, and this is looking at our current enrollment. So right now, you'll see at Dalton Elementary, we have 359 students. Ellington, 267 students. Hodge, 535. Lee, 361. Magnolia, 380. Murray, 464. Paramount, 633. Powell, 208. And Valleydale at 511. Now going to our three middle schools. We currently have six, 263 students at Center uh, Middle School, 285 students at Foothill, and 372 students at Slauson. And at our current two high schools, at Azusa High School, we have 1,206 students. At Gladstone High School, 629 students. And at Sierra High School, 183. And I would like to share, um, just so we can have a point of reference, Gladstone currently has 629 because we currently do not have any ninth graders at Glassstone. So it's not that the enrollment is just that much of a disparity. It's because we currently do not 
have any ninth graders at our um, high school. We have two other enrollments that I just wanted to share for um, context. Um, we have Longfellow, which is primarily our preschool, where we have a, a TK class of 10 students. And we have our non-public student, which are our students that are served by like our county office of education. We have 24 students enrolled there. Now we're gonna look at classrooms and capacity for all of our schools. So right now, based on all of our schools combined, and this is looking at every one of our schools, even the two um, that are, were closed in a previous year, we have 531 classrooms. If we look at our classroom size of 36 to one, meaning, meaning 36 students in one classroom, that means we have a capacity in our current school district of 19,116 students. If we looked at class size at 26 to one, again, 26 students in each classroom, we can fit 13,806 students in all of our classrooms. And we currently have an enrollment of 6,690 students. Now we're gonna look at our trend of declining enrollment. So since um, 14, 15 of the past years, our average decline for our district is 312 students a year. If we're looking at our enrollment of our current enrollment of 6,690 students, if that decline was to continue year over year, that means our enrollment in 23-24 would be 6,378. Um, in 25-26, we'll be at 6066. And in 25-26, we'll be at 5,754 students. Looking at the decline analysis, this is basically showing our enrollment to our actual capacity that we talked about in two previous slides. So as you can see, our enrollment is not even coming close to even 50% of our capacity. And looking at the trend of our decline, that will continue to be a concern going forward. And with that. All right, are there any questions or comments from the committee about the content of the presentation? None. Okay. All right, then we will move forward to item um, uh, 4.2, the committee orientation with legal counsel. Um, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the next, uh, uh, the next presentation, please. So while that's being pulled up, um, the goal for me tonight in this next presentation is really just to give you an introduction to kind of all of the all of the rules that apply to the operations of the committee so that you all can feel comfortable understanding kind of how things will operate and really what your goal and your intent is in being here. Um, we'll look at some portions of the education code to understand um, really the, the uh, goals and tasks of the committee. Um, we'll look at the Brown Act um, because as you as you all know by now, um, you know this is a meeting that is subject to um, all of the same rules as the Board of Education. Um, and we will also look at the uh, uh, the concepts of conflict of interest and some of those issues, just, just to make sure that everyone feels comfortable that those aren't things that are impacting them in their role um, here on the committee. Um, we're also going to do a brief introduction to the properties themselves. I'm sure you all are very familiar with them. So I'll just do a very brief introduction to their size, their location, just so we all have in mind the six sites that we're, that we're, uh, that we're tasked to review as the committee. And then finally, we'll look at some of the, uh, the big picture options for the site. So when you're thinking about some of the major questions that the committee is, is, um, is here to answer, um, you can um, also kind of think in your mind about, well, what, what could future options for these sites be if, if the committee decides that they're surplus? Okay. All right, so I think we've already done uh, the overview. So if we could go to slide three, that would be great. All right, so uh, so what is a 7-Eleven committee? Um, this, this is a concept, it's a requirement that comes from the education code, um, which says that when a district is considering a potential sale or lease or kind of other use of a property, that it's required to pull together this committee of the community to solicit feedback and to really hear from the community about what the best uses of those sites might be. Um, so if you look at those three boxes there, um, just go back up. Thank you. Um, so, you know, what does the code say about the composition of the committee? I'm sure you all saw in the, um, 
the forms that you filled out to show interest about being on the committee, there were uh, several types of the classifications that we asked you to, um, to note, right, if those fit. And there's a reason for that. Those, um, the, the code section that says what the committee has to look like says specifically that um, one person from each of those classifications at least has to be on the committee. Um, there's, there's also an intent within the code that uh, the committee like represent a cross section of the community. So, you know, people with varying interests and, um, uh, and backgrounds. Um, again, it's called a 7-11 because there has to be at least seven, but, uh, uh, but no more than 11 members. Um, not sure why they pick those exact numbers, but that's what's in the code. And so that's what we do. Um, and then finally, the goal is just to involve the community in decisions regarding the use of the property. All right, next slide, please. All right, so why are we here? I'm sure you are wondering, um, you know, what exactly is the committee going to do and what are the duties of the committee? Um, the first and foremost kind of the work product that comes at the end of the, of the work of the committee is a report that gets delivered to the Board of Education that provides a recommendation on the use or, um, or disposition of the property. Um, so this report is going to be drafted by, by you all with some assistance from me. Um, and really, it's again, it's a recommendation I want to highlight. The board makes the ultimate decisions about the use of its property. Uh, but the goal is that you've been given the opportunity to review the data. For example, the, uh, the presentation we just saw about um, enrollment and declining enrollment, and then any other data that you request that is relevant to these proceedings. Um, to you know, be able to kind of do a bit more of a deep dive into this and then provide a recommendation for the board. Um, the duties of the committee. Um, so again, you review the pertinent information to determine the amount of surplus space. So one of the first questions, one of the first things that we'll address in the report um, is, are these properties surplus? Is, you know, are, are they at a point where the district doesn't, doesn't need them for educational uses anymore? And so we should look forward to other potential uses for these sites. Um, there, there's going to be um, public hearing. So, you know, of course, we're going to have these, these public meetings, um, but at our third meeting, most likely, we'll also have a public hearing where it's even, even more encouraged uh, for folks from the community um, that, you know, haven't been to a prior meeting to come and, and to be a part of that, um, of that meeting as well. Um, and then finally, we'll develop the recommendations. Um, know that the purpose, again, of the committee is really just an um, advisory role, right? So we're making a recommendation to assist the board. Um, and really the whole thought is how do we use the public property responsibly? Next, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so for those of you that have ever been to a board meeting, you'll know that there's a series of rules. There's a, um, there's um, a statute in California that dictates how a legislative body um, has to do its, its business. And so because this particular committee is a committee of the Board of Education, it's also subject to the Brown Act. And so all of the actions of the committee will happen at a public meeting that's available to the public. Um, there's kind of these, you know, uh, four like poor tenants of what happens there, right? There's the agenda that we prepare that gets posted 72 hours in advance of the meeting. There are the meetings that we, that we hold where business is discussed. Um, there are public comments, right, to bring in the participation of the public, and then transparency is really the underpinning of the entirety of the Brown Act, so that the, uh, the public can see what the activities and the actions of the committee are. Um, and then just to reaffirm, the 7-11 committee is a legislative body that is subject to those rules, so in, in some ways the proceedings will look a little bit like a board meeting, not, um, not, not quite the same, but will borrow a lot of those same, those same concepts that you might be familiar with. All right, next slide, please. Um, so, so what is a meeting? This is something that I like to address because it seems really, really obvious, I think, to some people, but then you, you really think about it and there are ways that you could accidentally convene a meeting when you don't even mean to. Um, so, uh, so meeting is really a, um, when, a, um, when a majority of the committee is in the same place at the same time and they're talking about business. Um, so all of the meetings, right, all of the, all the situations in which a majority of you are together and talking about the business of the committee um, will be a meeting. And so those, all of those situations have to be made available to the public. Now for the board, you may have heard of closed session, and that is there are, there are certain exceptions in which a legislative body can, can have discussion about the business of that body um, in private, but there are only, uh, you know, a few 
a um, few exceptions in the code. Um, none of those exceptions most likely will apply to the business of this committee. So we won't ever have closed session, but I just wanted to kind of bring that, bring that full circle for those that may be thinking about the board, uh, the board meeting example. Um, so again, if there's a majority of the members that gather at the same time, place, uh, time and place to hear or discuss the business of the committee, it's a meeting. Um, next slide, please. So it's it's pretty clear when we're all here physically together, um, but sometimes you can actually have a meeting where you're where you're not all in the same room at the same time, um, and that is um, there are times when there's like a string of communications between you all, right? So if, if if each member had a conversation with the person next to them and then called the next member in line and communicated what they heard from the from the prior person, we would have a meeting um, without all of you, you know, potentially even knowing. Um, and so I say that just to, uh, just to kind of warn, even for example, if you're all like walking out, you know, to your cars at the end of the meeting, a number of you kind of gather together and you think, well, you know, there was, there was one more thing that I wanted to talk to so-and-so about that I heard them say in the meeting. Um, if a majority of you are all gathered together and you start to talk about the business, we have a meeting, um, at that point, And, you know, it would be against the Brown Act. So just, just be careful about the types of conversations and um, the extent to which you discuss the business of the committee with, with other committee members when we're not here in this room. Um, you, may, you may also see communications that come, you know, from, from me or Superintendent um, Ortega about the operation of the committee. Um, we, we will tend to, uh, to blind copy the remainder of the members. There's nothing secret going on there. It's really just so that you, we don't accidentally have a reply all issue that then, then creates a meeting. Um, so just know if you're, if you're seeing that, that's, that's what's going on. Um, okay, next slide, please. All right, so the meeting agenda, uh, which you will have for each meeting, um, is posted the 72 hours in advance, and then you'll also have it here in these binders. Um, so the goal with the binders is just to have kind of one place where you know all of your materials are going to be. Um, you're certainly free to, to take these binders home with you. You can also leave them here. I will, I will put them in a box. They will stay there. I'll put the new materials in them each, um, each, each time we have a new meeting and then pass them back out. So uh, know that that's, that's you know, the documentation that you'll have for these meetings. Um, again, the goal is just to, you know, have that agenda that both complies with the Brown Act, but then also gives you some idea of what we're going to be talking about in advance so you can have time to think it through. Um, some of the requirements for regular meetings under the Brown Act, um, again, I mentioned the 72 hours in advance, the posting of the agenda, um, which will always include the time and place of the meeting, identifies the business that's being discussed or transacted, um, and then is going to be posted in a location um, accessible to the public. Next slide, please. All right, so just as we did today, there was an opportunity for the public to make a comment and to participate. Um, and so subject to reasonable regulations, like a certain amount of time, um, they, this is something that we will do at each meeting. It's a part of the Brown Act, and so it's also incorporated here. Next slide, please. Okay, um, the other thing to come in mind, uh, or, or to keep in mind, that is, um, is that any of the documents that are produced in association with the meeting or that are distributed um, are, are also public records that are subject to review. Um, and so those, those items are made available here. And to the extent that there's anything passed out, you know, right before the meeting, those items will also be made available to the public. Um, and so there's, you know, some additional documentation and a procedure for how any of those additional documents are made available to the public should they be distributed before the meeting, but after the 72 hours. Next slide, please. Okay, so one thing that's really not from the Brown Act, but kind of, um, you know, speaks to how the meeting will operate um, is, a, is a set of rules, um, and they're called the Roberts Rules of, of, of Order. Um, it's kind of interesting. These rules were created in the late 1800s by an engineer um, who decided that he um, had been to a, to a series of meetings and really wanted a way to uh, uh, consistently like operate the procedure of those meetings. And so this is a picture here of Mr. Robert. Um, and really what this will mean for you all is there are three main things that I will highlight. Uh, the first is that um, the committee operates as a majority, right? So in, in order for the meeting to move forward, we have to have a quorum. So majority of the committee ha has to be present. Um, 
you will hear from folks at the district, um, from, from Hope, who will reach out in advance so that we make sure that we have a quorum at each meeting so that you all don't show up and we can't actually hold the meeting. Um, so that's that's something to know. Um, voting, every, every member has a single vote. And so when we're taking action, you will do that by vote. Um, there will be a, a motion, a second, and then a vote will be taken. Um, finally, every member also has also has the rights to make a motion. Um, so, you know, there there are going to be things on the agenda, but you also have the ability to bring up other things, to make a motion, to have a discussion about something. For example, you're going to always need a second to move that forward. Um, but it's it's you know just a procedure to be able to allow for open communication and really for each each member to have an equal say in the discussion. All right, next slide, please. All right, we are gonna move on uh, to a um, additional concept that I just wanna make sure everyone feels comfortable with. And that is that, you know, certain uh, public officials is um, how it's defined in the code sections, but there's this, uh, this obligation to not have a conflict of interest. Um, and these, these rules in the law, they really come from three different places, but they, they, they all relate to this concept that if we're doing business of the public, it shouldn't be impacted by our own personal interests. Um, and so the uh, the one I'm going to start with is the Political Reform Act here on the, uh, in the bottom in, in green. And what it really says um, is that no uh, no particular like public official should should benefit financially from their position. Um, now, most people will ask, well, what does it mean to benefit financially? Are there specific examples you can give me? Um, what it means is that we shouldn't make or participate or influence a particular decision that's being made by the committee or by the board um, or really by the agency as a whole if if we have a number of different interests. And I'll give you, you know, five examples from the code. Um, and, and they really all relate to, is there a foreseeable and significant financial impact? Um, the first of these is if you have a business um, investment or involvement, of over two thousand dollars, right? So if if um, if your decisions or your participation in the committee is gonna is going to have a foreseeable and significant impact in some business that you are a part of, then that that's that is seen as a potential conflict of interest. Um, uh, second is a real is a real property impact, right? So if the action of the committee or your particular action on the committee is going to have an impact on real property that you own. Um, and it's going to have a foreseeable and significant impact, then that could also be seen as a conflict of interest. Um, a third example is if it's going to impact a business from which you've received uh, income or salary in the past year, that could be a conflict of interest. Um, if it's going to impact any person or, or entity that's given you a gift of over $520 in the past year, that, that could be considered a conflict. Um, and then if it's going to have a foreseeable or significant impact on your personal finances. So those are those are really the kind of five main ways that are defined in the code to have a conflict. Um, I'll also just really, really briefly mention. Um, we'll go uh, two slides forward, please, uh, to government code section. 1090. Um, I'll, I'll mention this one really briefly, just because I don't think it's likely going to be impacted by uh, the action of this committee, um, but there's an additional rule that says you can't be involved in the making of a contract if you would be financially uh, impacted or interested in that particular contract. Here, because this committee is not really involved in the making of contracts, you're really just providing a recommendation to the board about the use of property. Excuse me, it's it's very unlikely that this this particular code is going to be implicated. Still thought it was important enough to uh, to mention it to you all, though. All right, and then. Uh, 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 the next slide, please. <clears throat> there is kind of one final source of potential conflicts, and that is even if it's there isn't going to be a foreseeable and substantial financial impact in your decisions, there's this um, kind of other section of the law that says if you feel that you really can't make an unbiased decision, right, that you're not able to make a decision that's in the best interest of the district of the public entity, um, for whatever reason, then that, you know, certainly could also be a conflict that, you know, could be grounds for you to recuse yourself or decide that you don't want to participate in the operation or the business of the committee. Um, if, if at any time during the operation of the committee, you, you have a concern about one of these conflicts or you, you know, want to want to understand more, um, feel free to reach out 
uh, to superintendent Ortega. And, you know, we can certainly have a conversation about that to get you an answer about whether or not we think there is a conflict there that should be concerning. All right, next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about the properties, um, which again, I'm sure you are all very familiar with, but I just want to make sure, you know, we have all six of them in mind. Um, and so we'll go slide by, uh, by slide here to talk about each. So next slide, please. All right, um, Ellington Elementary School. Um, so this site is 8.55 acres. It's shaped a bit like a Pentagon, kind of like a square and a triangle mixed together. Um, it's in Covina and a kind of a kind of a section of Co of Covina. Um, it is currently surrounded by uh, some retail on on one side by single family homes and then also by uh, like mixed use on a third side. Um, it is zoned as light agricultural currently. Um, so that's just you know some basic facts about the site when we look at it from a property perspective. All right, next slide, please. All right, uh, so Center Middle School, um, this site has a rectangular shape. Um, it's the largest of all the six sites that we're looking at as a part of the committee, 13.87 acres. Um, it's in Azusa um, and it is uh, surrounded on, on all four sides by uh, low density like residential properties, also zoned as light agricultural. All right, next site. Um, Mountain View Elementary. Um, this site has um, a square shape. It's about 8.5 acres, uh, the smallest of all six of the sites that we're looking at as the committee. Um, also in Azusa, and it, um, it is surrounded by single story residential and then some light industrial on one side. Um, it is zoned as uh, industrial school, or sorry, um, institutional school site. All right, next slide, please. All right, uh, Powell Elementary School, um, also in it's the kind of the far eastern side of Azusa. Um, it's, a, it's a square shaped property. It's about 9.14 acres um, and it is surrounded on uh, most sides by single family homes and then apartments and it is zoned um, in, institutional school. Next slide, please. All right, the uh, former Sierra High School Adult Education Center, also a square shaped parcel. It's about 9.7 uh, acres in size. Um, it's low to medium density on most sides and then a multifamily like residential also, um, and it is zoned uh, single family residential. And our final site is uh, Slauson Middle School. Again, it's a square shaped parcel, about 9.43 uh, acres in size. Uh, low and medium density homes surround the site, um, and it's currently zoned as institutional school uses. All right, so that's that's a really brief summary of those um, of those six sites, the size, the shape, and uh, some of the surrounding uses and zoning. Those are really kind of some of the uh, the basic facts about a property that I look at, you know, when I'm looking at it. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that is shared with you all. All, all of those things are public knowledge. Um, they're available, you know, through the county website, things like that. Um, next item that we'll look at are the property options. So when we're looking at a potential, um, you know, use or or change in use of a site, there are various options from a legal perspective um, for what the district can do with the site. Um, and these things I like to point out because usually some um, some or all of these are going to be mentioned in the report, kind of based on your recommendation for what what you think the board should do with the sites, um, or the you know freedoms or options that you think the board should should have to decide really what the what the best potential use is for the site. Um, so we'll talk through each of these just uh, just briefly. Um, I'm actually going to start at the bottom uh, with the use and license agreement. So even if a site is surplus to the educational needs of the district, um, meaning that the um, the district doesn't have a educational you know like a uh, classroom purpose, right, for that, um, for the site, there's still the potential option to keep actual like ownership of the site and to have a use or license agreement where someone comes in, um, you know, they do a, a lease or like a short term, a, a short term use of the site, uh, depending on the needs um, at that site. 
some of the benefits of that particular use are that the district is still the owner, right? So any value in that property, if it goes up or down, is still going to be to the district's benefit over time. Some of the drawbacks there is not all districts want to be landlords in all cases, right? There's extra cost, time, expense, um, and labor that, you know, is involved in being a landlord for, uh, for a site. Um, going to the right there, there's an exchange option. So the education code actually has this kind of unique option where a, um, a district can exchange a property for another site of similar value. Um, it still has to be within the boundaries of the district, but if there, you know, was some other location or some other like nature of a property that made more sense for a particular district goal or use, there's always the option to do an exchange assuming the owner of that property wants to exchange for the, for the property that you have to offer. Um, going upwards to green, there's always the option to retain, um, right? So it's not, you know, I don't want to sound like all of these options are getting rid of the parcel. There are certainly some that can retain it. For example, the use and license agreement is, is a retention of the property and just a different use from what it's been used for currently. Um, if we go to the left, um, a lease, you know, is kind of the same idea. Um, a lease is like a longer term version of a use or license agreement um, and you know, has has different qualities. Uh, it really has the same benefits and drawbacks, right, as the use and license. You know, the, the district still owns it. They still benefit from the increase or decrease in value, but they have to operate and maintain it as a landlord. Um, at the top, there's the sale option um, in purple. And, you know, sales take a number of different forms. They can be, uh, you can have a, a, a property sold for a number of different, uh, you know, uses and to different buyers. So that's really um, a much more diverse option than I think it, you know, looks like from the visual there. Um, but, you know, that is certainly one option. Um, and the, uh, the proceeds of a sale of surplus property goes back into a fund that is, that is used to benefit the properties that are currently at the district. So there is a restriction that the money that comes from those sales has to be used to um, upgrade or like upkeep facilities specifically. Um, the, the, the last option here that I've noticed or that I've, uh, that I've included is the waiver option. And this is really less of a... Um, use or like change in use of the property. And it's more of a particular procedure that you might choose to include in the report. Now, um, this is used because there's a section of the education code that says if the district decides to sell the property, there's a, there's a very strict uh, procedure and process by which that happens. So usually after, after we make a series of offers to other like public entities, um, there's the, the option to sell to for-profit entities. Um, the way that that has to be structured, though, is that there's a notice that uh, that goes out. People can um, express some interest, but they ultimately have to come to a board meeting and raise their hand and say, I want to buy it at this price. And then there's a bit of a, a auction that goes on and they can, you know, uh, someone else can uh, offer to buy it for more. Um, but that process isn't always the best option for the district, right? If you think about it, there's lots of potential um, you know, like unique uses or people that may have interest in a site that just can't come to that particular board meeting, no matter how far in advance you've given them notice of it. Um, or there's a, there's a process of negotiation for a value of a site, right? Or things um, outside of price that you might want to consider when you're thinking about who you're, you're going to sell the property to. And so the waiver process allows the district to submit um, an application for a waiver to the State Board of Education. The State Board then considers the uh, the reasons that the board is asking for the waiver, and then they uh, they ultimately, in in um, most cases, will approve it. And, and uh, what that means is that they say to uh, to the district, you know, you have flexibility in deciding how you want to go about um, finding a buyer for your site. You have the ability to do an RFP or you know have negotiations that don't have to just be in that very uh, formal setting. It also gives the district the ability to work with a realtor or with a professional that can kind of uh, help them solicit offers for the site. So that's um, that's mentioned here specifically because it is something that um, when when the uh, when or if the application for the waiver is made, they will uh, they will look to the 711 committee report to see if it was considered by the committee and if it was an option that the committee recommended for the board. All right, next slide, please. 
So in, you know, kind of wrapping up the content here, there were two main questions that I wanted to propose to the committee to consider as you're, as you're thinking about all of the work that you do, there are really two main things that we want you to think about and then include in the report. The first is, are the properties needed for, sc for school uses? And I say the properties here are plural, but really that question is for each individual property because they can be treated differently, right? Is that particular site that we're looking at does it, um, is it surplus to the needs of the district? And then the second question is, what subsequent use should that particular site have? And it could be, you know, any of those options that we talked about before. Um, but really, you know, I, I would say if you're, if you're unsure about really what is being asked of you, I would kind of return to these two, uh, these two like core questions to, you know, to really determine what the, what the role of the committee is. Right. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to give a minute here for any questions. I know that was a lot of content and it was all over the board. There's a lot of good information, but I'm sure you have questions or requests for additional information. So the other piece is if there's more data that you want to see, um, we are certainly happy to provide that to the extent that it's relevant here for the committee's operation. Um, before I take your questions, I will tell you that at the next meeting, there will be a substantial amount of information about the individual properties delivered. So the district has worked with a company uh, called DCG. Um, they have a board approved agreement where they have done uh, an uh, in-depth thorough analysis of each of the sites and kind of what their development potential or use options are. Um, it, it's, it is very thorough. And so that will be presented to the board um, for them to see in advance. And then also uh, staff from DCG will be here to speak with you all at the next meeting. So there's, there's lots more coming, but I just wanted to put this out here initially in case just based on this content so far, you have any questions or requests for information. Any questions from anyone? Sure. I have a question on the options for lease. Yes. So the money's from that. Does that go to upgrade the, uh, you know, the other properties? Those, those get? uses, they do um, all have those restrictions. So okay. yes. Lease yes. and the. Yes. Okay. Yes. In any of these options, um, we've heard that when there's properties not they're not being used. Mm -hmm. Can other sites such as start not other sites or other like charter schools, can they come in? How does that work with this? And so yes. So there there is um there is a requirement that if a if a charter school that's operating within the district um, makes a particular request for for use of a site, the district has some obligation to make a site available. It doesn't have to be one site in particular; just has to be a suitable space for the request. So, to the extent that there are um, surplus sites that are just kind of sitting and aren't being used for a district purpose, those uh, it is very possible to receive a request like that. So if one of these options were taken, can one of those schools come in or is it there a part where they can't? If, for instance, I would say like a sale, they can't obviously, right? Well, they can still make the request. It's just that the district doesn't have to offer that particular site. They'd have to find another suitable site to kind of fulfill the need of the request. So when you, when you just, when you, um, find an alternative use like a sale or a lease to another entity, it kind of pulls that site off the table, if that makes sense. Got it. Okay. Any other questions? Um, so, so I think this is a request. For sure. But, um, so look, there are six sites and I'm wondering if we can find out whether the district, even though based on all the statistics and the information, only is now using a certain, you know, the schools that they're using. If, if we need to consider that maybe two of the elementary school sites need to be kept or retained, because what if we do grow or can all of these something different be done? Is mm -hmm. my question. Okay. 
Is there, so, um, so help me understand the form of information that you think would be helpful there. Cause I think, you know, the initial thought was that the info or, or the information provided about declining enrollment helps with some of the, you know, the big picture numbers as a whole. Um, but with regard to individual sites, is there particular information that you think would be helpful? Or Ms. Jones, are you uh, requesting that uh, if we go back to the two questions, uh, that is supposed to be framing our mind is somewhere along this process. Will this committee be hearing from the district to say, look, this, these are some of the interests that we have. Is that, is that the question? Yeah. If the district still has a need, any one of those. Or... Got it. Okay. I definitely think that, uh, uh, that is something we can pull together some, some additional information for a, um, for, a, for a future meeting, certainly. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for the information. Um, <clears throat> personally, I, I would love to know the money spent on the schools. So then we know if we're going to lease it out, let's say how much we could get it for. And if we're maintaining the, the properties, you know, is that going to equal out, right? Does it make sense to, to lease it out? Are we going to make money? Um, I, I would also, I'm not sure if this is something that you guys can provide, but maybe some history regarding, um, have we ever sold any properties here? You, you know, um, anything to do with Azusa Unified before? I'm really curious, um, historically, like what have we done before? Maybe even what neighboring cities have done, like in the recent years. I'm just curious, right? Like, oh, Glendora sold this school. I had no idea. It became X, you know, X, Y, and Z, or they leased it, et cetera. You know, um, and then I think lastly, it, it would be something maybe to do with um, like what would be the timeline that we're hoping to get, you know, this information out to the board. And then the I, I'm not sure if it's too far ahead, but like what is the board? Like what or what's the school district's um, ultimate timeline in addressing these properties? Like we should have a final answer by this time. I know speaking to a lot of constituents and all of us, we're you know I think I think we want to give recommendations, but we also want to see what's going to happen and when, and we kind of want to know all of that timeline as well. Thank you so much. Sure. So I can give a just a little bit more information about the timeline of the committee that will kind of help. Uh, you know, lay out at least the initial framework. Um, so I would anticipate that if we can, if we decide to consider all of the six sites together and include them all in a single report, which is certainly one option. The other um, option, though, is that we can we can kind of break the six sites down into some like subsections, right? So if if you decide based on all the information that you get at the next meeting about the sites that you would really like to take them kind of bite by bite, you can. Um, you can decide to create an initial report that only speaks to a certain subset of the properties and then do a secondary report that speaks to the rest of them. Um, if you decide to lump them all together, it's probably about uh, four of these meetings, right? So this initial meeting, a second meeting to really dig into the content of, um, you know, presentation options and data about each site. Um, we may also bring just a very initial version of the report to the next meeting so you can see what that what that document looks like and start to kind of anticipate what the content of it will be. Um, your third meeting will be the public hearing where we'll also you know, talk in detail about the drafting of the report. That's really kind of a, um, a drafting heavy meeting. Um, I say that it's not that you all are doing drafting. It's that, you know, we're having a conversation about the content of the report. Um, then you'll have the public hearing on it. And then the final meeting is just a final approval of that report. Now, if, if additional time is needed or, a, you know, a, a fifth meeting is requested to, to, you know, have more conversation, that's certainly an option. Um, but for the goal of expediency and not having you all have to take, you know, more time than, than is needed, you know, four meetings is kind of the standard on this. Um, usually we have about one one meeting per month just to give everyone, staff, and all of us the time to kind of turn things around, get the minutes ready, you know, get things posted and prepare content. Um, and then also to make sure that we're not taking, you know, um, more of your time each month than is necessary. We kind of, you know, space them out that way. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, it's going to take at least, you know, four or five months for the committee to do its work. At that point, a report gets presented to the board. Um, the board gets to consider that and uh, 
you know, think about additional options, you know, do additional exploration. They not, their um, boards aren't always ready on that day to decide exactly where things are going, but they, you know, that's certainly the first step in that direction. Um, then I mentioned, right, that there's, there's this process in the code, right, where we, if, for example, one of the sites, the board decides to sell, we, you know, we don't know any of that yet. That's all very much up in the air, but, you know, say that that does happen with one site, there's this, uh, obligation to make these uh, like statutory offers to public entities, there's, um, there's a timeline associated with that. So there's, uh, you know, 60 days where that has to be open and then additional negotiation time. So um, I say all that to say the process moves slowly because there are so many statutory requirements about how offers have to be made and time left open for negotiation. So I wouldn't anticipate that any of this is going to happen fast. Um, each process kind of has to happen in order, but hopefully that at least gives you some idea of, you know, the various things in play and at least, you know, this first half of what the timeline looks like. And I, I've, I've noted all the other questions that you had. We can certainly take a look at those and bring more information back. All right. If there is nothing else on that, then we will, um, I guess there are uh, two other things I will mention just while we're here about the uh, content or the items that are in your in your binder, um, there is a just a quick uh, kind of a cheat sheet of the roles and responsibilities of the committee that I've included here. It just kind of summarizes what I've said today in a way that hopefully is you know kind of useful and summarized for you. Um, the other item that is here is in the uh, the second tab of your binder are both of the resolutions that were approved by the board to form and then appoint the committee. So you'll see here, you know, this is all of the information that was board approved to bring us all here today. All right, um, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, this is in section five, section uh, or item 5.1 rather, um, election and appointment of the committee chairperson. So this item, uh, the intent here is that as, as I have um, you know, tried to facilitate this whole meeting for the committee tonight, um, moving forward, it's our goal that the committee will facilitate itself. And so you'll have a chairperson that will run through the agenda, um, and that will do the facilitation. So uh, the 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 goal here in this action is to appoint a chairperson. Um, does anyone uh, want to either um, kind of you know put themselves up for this position or uh, put someone else forward for the position of chairperson? What we'll do is we'll collect names and then um, someone will make a motion and then we'll make a second and then we'll vote just to kind of lay out the procedure. So I guess I'll say, is is anybody interested in being in being the chairperson of the committee? And Sarah, we we um will will be supportive of, of that person and help them and you know, Absolutely. even like a pre-meeting to walk through and you know, those kinds of things. Yes. Don't feel like we're just, you know, setting you out in the cold. I'm certainly, I, I, I will continue to help facilitate. Good. Good to go. Okay. Yes. Is it possible for me to nominate Vanessa Jones? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So we have a, a motion and a second, and then let's take a vote. So um, all that are uh, in agreement to have Ms. Jones as the chairperson of the committee, say aye. All right, any that are opposed, say nay. All right, so the action is unanimous, excellent. Congratulations. Okay, the next action is in item 5.2, um, and this is really uh, optional for the committee. It's not something that you uh, have to choose to do, but it's an, it's an option that I like to give. Um, so sometimes the committee wants to appoint a kind of a, a smaller subcommittee, either one or, or more people that want to be a bit more involved in the drafting of the report. Um, the way this usually works is I do an initial draft to kind of give you an idea of, you know, uh, the framework of really what we're looking for. And then all of that content will get discussed in these meetings and you'll have an opportunity to be a part of it. Um, some folks want to, you know, see and discuss that content before the meeting. Of course, we do all of that compliant with the Brown Act, but it's just if there's one or two individuals that um, want to take that role on, um, certainly, again, optional if we just really want to focus that, focus that content into these meetings.
Is there is there anyone that feels strongly or wants to make a motion that we uh, that we have a subcommittee involved that's more involved in the drafting as opposed to it just being you know brought in front of the full committee? Okay. Okay. Well, we can always, you know, um, bring this back at a different meeting. I can, I can put it on the agenda for the next meeting as well, just in case at that point you feel like it's like it's needed. But for now, um, we will, we will not take action on that particular item. Okay. So moving forward to item six, um, the next scheduled meeting. Really, this is just here as a point of information uh, for the committee and for the public. So our, our next meeting has been scheduled for April the 12th. Um, so we're just about a month out there. Um, and the goal will be to convene here, um, same time and same place on that date. To, oh, to, to approve, okay. Gotcha, okay. Um, so, um, can I get a motion to approve that date for the next meeting? Motion to approve at the Thank April 12th, 2023 meeting. Thank you. And can I get a second? Sure. Thank you. Okay. And then um, all in favor? Aye. All right. All opposed? All right. So the motion passes unanimously. Um, all right. So we will move on to item seven, the adjournment. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Oh, sorry, vote. Um, and um, all in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, all opposed? All right, seeing none, thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>